Philip the Second by William Thomas Walsh. Chapter three Henry the Eighth's Divorce fifteen thirty three. It was in the tragic year fifteen thirty three, when Philip was six years old, and his mother lay at the point of death, that the famous divorce case reached its unholy climax. No one could have foreseen, when Henry the Eighth first met Anne Boleyn in fifteen twenty two, that the fate of the world for centuries was at stake. Kings paying lip service to Christianity had broken marriage vows for a thousand years or more, and a few had died in their sins. Yet never before had a king been willing to rend the seamless garment of the church to make a woman of her sort a queen. By the year 1530, Wolsey was disgraced and dead. The more sinister Thomas Cromwell was high in the king's favour, and with the counsel of this subtle politician, Henry was advancing rapidly towards his object. From several universities where it was always possible to find elements of dissent, he had obtained favourable opinions. All over Europe he spent money liberally, buying what would now be called expert advice. There was a doctor at Siena known as Il Decio, who wrote out a dissertation for him. Charles' ambassador, reporting the fact on September 11th, 1530, added, Decio has promised also to allegate for us, and although I am not fond of this sort of thing, I am ready for the sake of that poor queen to pay in this instance as well and perhaps better than the English. Two months later, Maisa Mai wrote from Rome that among those who have given their opinions here in favour of the king is a converted Jew who now goes by the name of Marco Gabriello, to whom the King of England has offered as much money as he may ask, having instructed his ambassadors to have him sent to England. As this man's journey cannot be for a good purpose, we are afraid that with the votes the king has got already, and with Gabriello's presence in England, the parliament may be persuaded to grant that which he has so long threatened. I have written Scalenga at Asti to arrest the Jew if he pass there. Antonio de Leva should do the same if the Jew go through Milan. But it appears that Gabriello got to England and delivered his expert opinion. Henry had Stokesley, his solicitor, consult various Jews in Venice, Bologna and elsewhere. By this time, however, the heavy influence of Charles V began to make itself felt even in Venice, and officials there put an end to the researches of Francis Chinus. Not, however, before he had obtained and sent off to England an imposing opinion in Hebrew from Rabbi Jacob Raphael ben Yehael Chaim Maglioni of Medina. Neither Messer Francis Chinus nor his master, Guinucci at Venice, who sent it off to Henry, seems to have been aware that the good rabbi, weighing the disputed texts in Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 18.16, concluded that Henry had been married to Catherine in the eyes of God and could not annul the contract on the grounds alleged. This document, now in the British Museum, was not used in the divorce proceedings. The fears of Maisa Mai about the next English Parliament proved to be only too well conceived. The astute little group who had wound their influence about the mind and will of Henry VIII had seen to it that there would be on hand enough politicians bound by interest or subserviency to the king's cause to pass any measures the monarch might desire. Great industry had been used in managing elections for this Parliament and they were so successful in returning such members as the king wanted that he was resolved to continue them till they had done his work, both in the affair of the divorce and the business of the Reformation. Some of the spirituality also ran on with the stream, not knowing where it would carry them. Sir Thomas More opened the session of 1530. His name, however, did not appear among the signatories of a letter sent to Pope Clement on July 30th, signed by the Archbishops of York and Canterbury, the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, several earls, four bishops and various knights, barons and abbots. The letter, couched in a very lofty, moral tone, accused the Pope of ingratitude towards King Henry, the justice of whose cause had been acknowledged by the most famous universities. Indeed, this was a universally acknowledged truth. We do again and again beseech you for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, whose vicar on earth you style yourself, and that you now conform your actions to that title by pronouncing your sentence to the glory and praise of God. 
Clement's reply to this pious insolence was affectionate, tactful, grave for the most part, but now and then mildly witty. It is a neglected apologia in his own words for his conduct of the difficult case, and it leaves no doubt he understood its importance. As for the present case, we shall give no hindrance or delay to its decision, being desirous to free your king, your queen and our own selves from this troublesome affair. But the Parliament should not require more than we can without offending God can perform. Clement must have known, of course, that the secret instigator of the parliamentary letter was Henry, or Henry's new master, and he must have concluded by then that what Henry wanted was not a fair trial, but his own way. This answer, wrote the historian of Parliament, had very little effect on the minds of those who were being resolved to abrogate the Pope's supremacy in England and strip the Church of its overgrown possessions. There lay the real issue. Secret and powerful forces, which had not yet disclosed their hand, were using the king's weariness of his wife, his infatuation for Anne, and his hope of a male heir, as instruments in pursuit of their own ends. Charles and his advisers knew this before the end of 1530, and inclined to blame the Pope, especially for his allowing Henry to get opinions from the universities. Catherine wrote in Spanish a burning letter to the Pope, of which Chapuis sent the Emperor a copy on December 21st, complaining that her just petitions had been neglected. I beg and entreat your holiness not to allow any further delays in this trial, but at once pronounce final sentence in the shortest way. Some days ago, my Samai, the ambassador of his imperial majesty and my solicitor in this case, wrote to say that your holiness had promised him to renew the brief which your holiness issued at Bologna, and another one commanding the king, my lord, to dismiss and cast away this woman with whom he lives. On hearing of it, these good people, who have placed and still keep the king, my lord, in this awkward position, began to give away, considering themselves lost. One thing I should like your holiness to be aware of, namely that my plea is not against the king, my lord, but against the inventors and abettors of this cause. I trust so much in the natural goodness and virtues of the king, my lord, that if I could only have him two months with me, as he used to be, I alone should be powerful enough to make him forget the past. But as they know this to be true, they do not let him live with me. These are my real enemies, who wage such constant war against me, some of them that the bad counsel they gave the king should not become public, though they have been already well paid for it, and others that they may rob and plunder as much as they can. These are the people from whom spring the threats and bravado profit against your holiness. They are the sole inventors of them, not the king, my lord. It is therefore urgent that your holiness put a very strong bit in their mouths, which is no other than the sentence. Clement hesitated between conflicting counsels, hoping no doubt that the infatuation of Henry would burn out before it set all Christendom afire. Meanwhile, the inventors and abettors of the cause celeb were justifying only too well the Queen's fears of their astuteness. They were a small but extremely powerful minority, more international than English in their loyalties and associations. They had needed only an occasion and a pretext. They found both in Henry's infatuation. Anne Boleyn, or Bullen, the spearhead of the attack, whose power lay in the mysterious sexual attraction she exerted over Henry had been educated in the most corrupt and anti-Catholic court in southern Europe, that Navarrese court of Marguerite de Angoulême, sister of Francis I, and author, like Don, of works both pious and salacious. The accusation of incest with her brother, King Francis, rests upon a doubtful passage in a single letter, and may be dismissed for lack of real evidence. It is probably only a coincidence that the rather uncomely daughter of Sir Thomas Berlin, who was Marguerite's protégé, was to be put to death at last on a similar charge. There is no doubt of the laxity of faith and morals in the semi-pagan atmosphere of Marguerite's court, or of the instant appeal that Luther's teaching made to persons already anxious to escape from the reproach of a divine standard with which the Catholic Church persisted in confronting human guilt. Marguerite herself became a Protestant. As early as 1521, her preacher, Gerard Roussel, probably, like most of his name in southern France, 
of Jewish origin, cast off his Dominican robes and hurried to Germany to see Luther. Long before Englishmen dreamed of a separation of England from the Catholic Church, Anne Boleyn returned to England a secret heretic. Whether or not her father, Sir Thomas Boleyn, shared her views at that time, he certainly did before the divorce. Chapuis wrote Charles V in 1531, The general opinion is that the lady and her father, who are more Lutherans than Luther himself, have been the principal instruments in the release of a heretic priest sent to prison by Henry's officers for denying that the Pope was head of the church. Anne had a wart and something like a goiter and a sixth finger on one hand. Her most attractive features seemed to have been a handsome pair of dark eyes and fine black hair. She had an irresistible charm for some men, of whom Henry was not the first, and a powerful will which desired to be not a royal mistress, but a queen. Against this woman of darkness, as most of the people of England regarded her, stood two powerful forces, the ancient landed nobility of England with all their traditions, and the rock of St Peter, defending the institution of Christian marriage, and the whole body of Christ's teachings. To get rid of the second, by far the more formidable because of spiritual power, she had to obtain power over the first. More than that, she had to set up a false spiritual authority to blind men to the real one until her object was secured. It is hardly likely that Anne was conscious of all this from the beginning, but such were the necessities of her case. Whether she sought them or they sought her, Two instruments presented themselves, ready for her purposes. One was Thomas Cromwell, the other was Cranmer. Cromwell, the moneylender, was one of the first of the men of obscure origin who arose to form the new ruling class of England. His father, like the founder of the Cecil family, was a small public housekeeper. Thomas, one of those born usurers who could be so useful to great men, became a confidential agent of Wolsey. As his master fell, he betrayed him and formed contacts with the king, the Duke of Norfolk and the Boleyns, which made him presently the master of the royal policy. Norfolk had him elected to the Parliament of 1529. Cromwell had also international contacts, had travelled about the continent and may have fought in Italy. With no religion but greed for gold and power, he was utterly unscrupulous, bold and insolent when he could afford to be, cringing if necessary. All his life, even after he had grown enormously rich on the loot of the monasteries, he added to his wealth by usury. He was the founder of the Cromwell family, which for the next century would throw its powerful influence between the English people and the Catholic faith they still loved. His nephew and the daughter of another usurer from Genoa became the grandparents of Oliver Cromwell. It was the function of Thomas Cromwell to lead Henry by gradual steps to a position from which he could not retreat, to terrorise all political opposition by a reign of blood and to set up a wall of material interest against both the church and the ancient nobility he and his friends wished to supplant. Cranmer had been Anne Boleyn's chaplain. He had studied at Cambridge where Erasmus sowed the seed of the English revolt and where there existed a clique in communication with anti-Catholic forces on the continent. Cranmer's part was to set up a spurious religious authority to bewilder and to silence the more timid Catholics. The aged Archbishop of Canterbury, Wolsey's successor, would have nothing to do with granting a divorce. He was very feeble, however, and, as soon as he died, Cromwell and the Boleyns tricked Pope Clement, who still hoped for a reconciliation, into making Anne's chaplain Archbishop, while Cranmer signed a secret oath denying the Pope's authority. In so Catholic a country as England, such a conspiracy could hardly have succeeded, perhaps, had the King of France not played the despicable role that French policy so often adopted during critical phases of the Church's history. As Gairdner says, the repeated threats of England to cast off allegiance to the See of Rome might no doubt have been regarded as empty vapour if no other European potentate had shown any disposition to keep Henry in countenance. But the support that he had all along received from the French King and the evidence now given of a strong and cordial alliance between the two sovereigns filled the Pope with the most serious apprehensions. At the beginning of 1531, Clement forbade Henry to remarry until the case was decided. He repeated the warning in two subsequent briefs. In 1532, learning that the king was already cohabiting with Anne, 
the Pope ordered him, under pain of excommunication, to dismiss her and take back his wife. The threat remained suspended while the harassed pontiff struggled with Lutheranism in Germany, the Turkish menace in the East, the demand for a general reform council, and the conflicting interests of Charles and of Francis. The loss of his English revenue too was important. Parliament in 1532 passed an act suspending English first fruits in future, but added that the act should have no validity unless Henry so desired. Many of the members doubtless thought the bill was a mere formality to help the king in his negotiations. Henry now informed Clement that he would cut off the first fruits, the annate of Canterbury alone amounted to 10,000 ducats, unless the Pope allowed Cranmer's bulls. When Clement sent a nuncio to discuss the matter, Henry received him with great honour, for, if there had been the smallest apparent evidence that the relations between Henry and the Pope were getting strained on account of the divorce question, it is not improbable that the popular feeling would have manifested itself in a manner by no means agreeable either to the King or to Anne Boleyn. Clement made the fatal mistake, however, of allowing the bulls. His Holiness will repent of this, wrote Chapuis to the Emperor, for he will lose his authority here. While Francis I was telling the Pope that he was so united with Henry VIII in aims and interests that any displeasure done to the one must necessarily be felt strongly by the other, and writing to two cardinals that, at present princes will hardly suffer the Pope to infringe on their privileges and preeminences. Henry had got a priest to preach before him and Anne that he had been living in adultery with Catherine, and that all good subjects should pray God to pardon his offence and advise him to take another lady, even despite the Pope. For, said the preacher, it was a case in which the king should obey God rather than man. Early in 1533, so secretly that the date is still disputed, Henry and Anne were married. In March, the king sent Anne's brother, Rochford, to Francis I to say that he had married the lady, as Francis had advised when they met at Calais, and that she was pregnant. This news, of course, found its way to Spain. The lady, not satisfied with what has already been done, wrote Chapuis to the emperor, has lately importuned the king to ask the queen for a very rich and gorgeous piece of cloth, which she herself brought from Spain as an ornamental robe for a christening, and of which the lady is very desirous, and, as it appears, may be very soon in want of. Anne was behaving so arrogantly that even her grandfather, the Duke of Norfolk, called her a great whore. Though the king is by nature kind and generously inclined, wrote Chapuis, this Anne has so perverted him that he does not seem the same man. On Good Friday of that fateful year, the crucifixion of Christ's church in England, and all over the world in due course, was made inevitable. All steps taken up to that time might have been undone. But now the definite breach began, even though secretly and in the dark. On that April 11th, 1533, Cranmer, vested in the authority the Pope had been che cheated into bestowing upon him, wrote a humble letter to the King, urging that he be allowed to determine the course of matrimony. On that April 11th, 1533, Cranmer, vested in the authority the Pope had been cheated into bestowing upon him, wrote a humble letter to the King urging that he be allowed to determine the cause of matrimony. The next day, Holy Saturday, Henry replied that it was impossible to be displeased by a suggestion prompted by zeal for justice and the quiet of the kingdom, and though he recognised no superior on earth, he would gladly submit his cause to the principal minister of his spiritual jurisdiction. A month later, Cranmer pronounced sentence. Meanwhile, Anne appeared publicly in royal state on Easter Eve, wearing the jewels of Catherine. The public seemed stunned. When a prior of the Augustinians asked his congregation that week to pray for the health and welfare of Queen Anne, most of the people left the church in disgust before the sermon was over. Even Francis I expressed great displeasure on hearing what had happened and declared that he had tried to dissuade Henry from marrying his concubine. When Anne, in a velvet mantle with a high ruff, rode in a white litter under a gold canopy to Westminster Abbey to be crowned by Cranmer on a platform appropriately and ominously covered with red cloth. The English people refused to take off their hats or to cry, God save the Queen. The imposing cortege 
headed by the French merchants in violet velvet, each wearing a sleeve of the lady's colours, might have passed in silence if some had not cried out, Horse and knaves! French dogs! at the French ambassador and his suite, while others called Cranmer, one of the judges of Susanna, and still bolder ones cried, Ha! Ha! at the initials of Henry and Anne, painted in various places where scaffolds were set up for mystery plays and wine flowed from fountains. Not even a timid Medici Pope, who had swallowed an affront to his legate, Wolsey, and had permitted himself to be cajoled time and time again by Henry and Cromwell, could overlook the public contempt shown for his own authority. Clement proceeded to excommunicate Henry in July, yet secretly, with a threat to publish the sentence by September if Henry did not put Anne away. Henry was frightened and hesitated. He could no longer trust Francis I, who was soon to meet the Pope to arrange for the marriage of his second son to Catherine de' Medici. So he conferred with his doctors, his professors, his experts, who told him that a great wrong had been done him and that he should appeal to the next general council. This he did and felt more secure. Besides, all his physicians and astrologers were promising that Anne's child would be a boy. Even then, Clement had made known decision on Henry's marriage, hoping apparently for an issue that would be for the honour of God and the upholding of justice, as he wrote Charles in July, when congratulating him on the Empress's recovery. He denied that the delays had been his fault, but attributed them to difficulties raised by Catherine's lawyers. Not until March 23rd, 1534, did the Pope pronounce Henry's marriage to Catherine valid after eight years of delay and intrigue. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was born, September 7th, 1533. Henry was disappointed, but most of his subjects were delighted. A boy would undoubtedly have ended the chances for the succession of the Princess Mary, whom the people loved. Mary was then 18. Chapuis, who went in disguise to see her, pass on her way to become virtually a lady's maid to the bastard, had the pleasure of witnessing such grace and beauty coupled with a true royal spirit and garb that I felt double pity and commiseration at seeing her so ill-treated. Mary and her mother lived in daily fear of being poisoned by Anne Boleyn, who hated them with the ferocity of a despised woman in power. Catherine would eat no food but what was prepared in her own rooms, where she was a perpetual prisoner. Mary was deprived of her title and officially declared a bastard. Their lives probably hung on the frail thread of Henry's fear that Charles V would make war to avenge his relatives. Charles was not eager to fight at a moment when his coffers were empty, the Eastern Empire overrun, Germany torn by religious dispute, and his enemy Francis I ready to pay old scores at the first opportunity. Nevertheless, it was well known in London that imperial and family pride could not be outraged beyond a certain point. Cromwell, with his fat face and little crafty eyes buried in flesh, had the effrontery to sound Chapuis more than once on whether the emperor would really take it to heart if his aunt and his cousin were put to death. In March 1535, he hinted politely to Chapuis that both Catherine and Mary were mortal. What harm or danger could there be, he added slyly, in the princess dying just now? Whatever people might say or think about it, would the emperor, I ask you, have reason to regret her death? Chapuis reported to his master. My reply was that as we were just then trying to bring about a closer friendship between our respective masters, with a view not to waste time, I would refrain from representing the great dangers and inconveniences likely to arise were the princess to die suddenly in these times and in a matter so open to suspicion. God forbid that such a thing should come to pass, and may she be preserved for the peace and tranquillity of the world. Cromwell then dangled before the ambassador the bait of Henry's support in arranging a general council for the reform of the church. He offered the bribe also of a marriage for young Prince Philip, then eight years old, to this king's illegitimate daughter, Elizabeth, whom they call the Princess of Wales. But perceiving the mien I put on, he said only two more words, and without waiting for my answer, he, def he himself added, I dare say, however, that His Majesty the Emperor will not hear of it out of respect for the princess, his cousin. The English Revolution, so skilfully and gradually promoted by a small minority, acting through bribed or cowed politicians, was now entering upon its final and decisive phase. 
in spite of the fait accompli of the divorce, the coronation and the birth of Elizabeth, in spite of the open breach with Rome, the English church still remained thoroughly Catholic in principle and in sympathy and was loved and supported. With any Catholic leadership worthy of the name, there would have been a popular uprising that would have swept away Cromwell and the Boleyns and all their hirelings. While the English people waited for help from the Emperor and hoped that they would somehow muddle through when Henry tired of Anne and all this nauseating nonsense, Cromwell was showing himself a master of the modern technique of building up a false revolution as a pretext for transferring power from one minority to another. He proceeded by slow and cautious steps at first. Through Cranmer in 1534, he caused all the clergy who would sign to make a declaration that the Bishop of Rome had no more jurisdiction in England than any other foreign bishop. Both universities signed the declaration. Likewise, under fear of suppression, did various monasteries, especially the wealthier and laxer ones. In so doing, they played directly into Cromwell's hands. On the other hand, the orders of friars resisted. This was a serious matter, for they had the best and most popular preachers. Their great spiritual strength was that they had no property to lose. Having re refused collectively to sign, the monks were subjected to an inquisition one by one, commencing with the two Franciscan Observantine monasteries at Richmond and Greenwich. To a man, they refused to deny the Pope's spiritual authority. A few days later, two carts full of the brown-robed followers of St Francis were seen joggling through London to the Tower. In November 1534, a bought and bullied Parliament passed acts declaring Henry the head of the Church and granting him the titles and first fruits of the Pope. In January 1535, a council decree added his new title to his style. The legalistic revolution was now complete, but the whole revenue of the English church, about $35 million a year in our money, was yet to change hands, and a reign of terror was thought necessary to prevent the inevitable reaction when men realised the full import of what had been done. The first notable martyrdom was that of the Charterhouse monks, May 4th, 1535. The Empress and young Philip must have heard of it about June 1st. The victims were dragged from the Tower to Tyburn, said the dispatch from London, and, without respect for their order, hanged with great ropes. While they were still alive, the hangman cut out their hearts and bowels and burned them. Then they were beheaded and quartered, and the parts placed in public places on long spears and it is believed that one saw the other's executions fully carried out before he died, a pitiful and strange spectacle, for it is long since persons have been known to die with greater constancy. No change was noted in their colour or tone of speech, and while the executioner was going on, they preached and exhorted the bystanders, with the greatest boldness, to do well and obey the king in everything that was not against the honour of God and the church. It was altogether a new thing, added Chapuise, that Anne Boleyn's father and brother, and even her grandfather, the Duke of Norfolk, one of the judges who had condemned the monks to death, were present with other lords and courtiers, and quite near the victims. The king himself, it was said, had been eager to see the butchery. It was to be feared that Henry was growing so used to cruelty that he would employ it towards Catherine and others, to which the concubine will urge him with all her powers. The said concubine is more haughty than ever, and ventures to tell the king that he is more bound to her than a man can be to a woman, for she extricated him from a state of sin, and moreover, that he came out of it the richest prince that ever was in England, and that without her he would not have reformed the church to his own profit and that of all the people. Other executions followed, and most of the higher clergy were cowed. There is an illuminating revelation of the state of some of the secular priests in a grovelling letter of the Archbishop of York to Cromwell, July 1st, 1535, agreeing to obey orders to have it preached, that the king was head of the church, but protesting that, I do not know twelve secular priests in my diocese that can preach. Those who have the best benefices are not resident. Many benefices are but four pounds, five pounds or six pounds, so that no learned men will take them, and we are fain to take those who are per presented. I hope the king will consider this and be content with my doing the best I can. As in so many persecutions of the church, before and since, the enemy received decisive support at the critical moment from broad-minded 
compromising political Catholics who were either willing to sell Christ for a consideration or, more commonly, were deceived or frightened into thinking in their flabby souls that their temporising would best serve the cause. In St Thomas More and in John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, there was more heroic stuff. Both were prisoners in the Tower in May 1535. Fisher had been there for months. Both were threatened with death before St John's Day unless they took the oath of supremacy. Both refused. Pope Clement, meanwhile, had died, October 1534, shortly after his tardy defence of Catherine's marriage. The new pontiff, Paul III, hastened to make Fisher a cardinal, hoping that Cromwell would not dare to touch a prince of the church. The Pope's action had the opposite effect. Henry was infuriated, Cromwell's hand was strengthened, and on June 22nd, the head of the venerable Bishop of Rochester was hacked off and exposed on London Bridge to the amazed reverence of the people. The next day, according to Chapuis, Henry rode 30 miles from London and walked an additional 10 miles at 2 o'clock in the morning to see a performance of a farce which was a travesty of part of the apocalypse in which he was represented cutting off heads of the clergy. Henry was greatly pleased, discovered himself to those present and ordered the performance repeated four days later so that Anne could enjoy it. But as Gairdner observes, it is hard to conjecture what place in Catholic England would permit such an exhibition. If the story is true, the performance must have been private for a picked audience. The time would point to one of those nocturnal sessions of heretical secret societies which have been held from time to time in various parts of Europe, such as those of the Cathari in France, the Alambrados in Spain. In that case, it seems hardly probable that Chapuis should have heard of it. At all events, Moore's death followed on July 6th. Some wondered why he did not speak more vigorously against the king's pretensions, but his letter to his daughter Margaret after Cromwell's examination of him on June 3rd leaves no doubt of his motive, which was characteristic. Cromwell asked why, if he did not mind dying, he did not speak out plain against the statute. It was clear that he was not content to die, though he said so. The saint answered, I have not been a man of such holy living that I might be bold to offer myself for death, lest God, for my presumption, might suffer me to fail. Mr Secretary then said, He liked him worse than the last time, for then he pitied him, but now he thought he meant not well. The death of Moore shocked the Christian world inexpressibly. When Charles heard of it months later, he said that he would rather have lost the richest city in the empire than such a counsellor. Within the year, two versions of the martyrdom were printed in German, and Protestants were as indignant as Catholics over the wanton execution of the great wit, the scholar, the friend of Erasmus. Henry's name became a hissing in all corners of Europe. Lord Darcy sent word to Chapuis that there were 1,600 nobles and gentry in the north of England ready to raise the banner of the crucifix side by side with the imperial eagle if Charles would give them the slightest encouragement. Lord Sands, one of Henry's own captains, promised that if the emperor invaded England, there would be little resistance. At that moment, Charles was hundreds of miles away, engaged in a crusade that seemed to him more urgent than saving his aunt, or even waiting for his beloved wife to bear the child she expected in a few weeks. When he left Spain, he had probably not even heard of the martyrdom of the Carthusians. On the day of Fisher's death, he was in camp before Tunis under a blazing sun. When Moore suffered, he was preparing for battle against what seemed overwhelming odds. The only man who could have saved England by force was engaged in a desperate conflict on another front of the international battle line of Christendom. The vile spirit that hates Christ and the people of Christ seldom strikes in one place at a time. It was not enough that Germany was splitting into sects, agreed in little but common hatred of the Catholic Church, that Hungary bled beneath the heel of the Turks, that Poland was becoming honeycombed by heresy, that France should repeatedly play the role of a Judas, and that England should be mastered by the enemies of Christendom. At the most critical period of the English Revolution, when Anne Boleyn was mounting the scarlet dais in Westminster Abbey, the Turk launched a blow at Northern Africa with such success that not only was Spain in danger of being overrun by new hordes of barbarians, not only was Charles's great empire vitally threatened on its southern segment, but the whole Western world, almost all that civilization which venerated the cross of Christ, 
and drew its culture from the inspiration of his church, was threatened by a vast manoeuvre from North Africa. As if two great pincers were closing in, one aimed at the heart of Austria, the other at Spain. The wars that Francis I had forced upon Charles, Francis might answer that destiny had forced them on him by making Charles heir to lands encircling France, had given Solomon the Magnificent several opportunities. The Turk had seized Belgrade, he had conquered Hungary. He had won a naval advantage by driving the Knights of St John from Rhodes in 1522. Charles had settled them at Tripoli and Malta, henceforth the outposts of Christendom on the western Mediterranean, but the east was lost. Turkish pirates had attempted to kidnap Pope Leo in 1516. In 1534, the notorious renegade admiral, Ker Edin, or Barbarossa, had almost succeeded in capturing the beautiful Duchess of Trejeto for the Sultan's harem and had sacked and burned Fundi in rage over her escape. This aged Barbarossa, with his bushy red beard and eyebrows, was for years the scourge of southern Christendom. The mention of his name was almost enough to depopulate a village. His second in command was a Jew named Sinan, also an ex-Christian. During the wars in Italy between France and Spain, Redbeard was consolidating Mohammedan gains in North Africa, with Algiers as his capital. Then, in 1533, having seized the rocky island of Pinon and butchered its small Spanish garrison, he launched a blow at Tunis, fortified it heavily, and had extended his power over a wide hinterland. This was a challenge which Charles could not ignore. Naples, the gateway to Italy, and Sicily, the great Spanish naval base in the Mediterranean, were now wide open to attacks by fleets of corsairs. The existence of a large population, still secretly in sympathy with Mohammedanism and the port, created a danger for Spain that only a fool could overlook. Numberless hordes of fanatical warriors might be taken from Africa to Spain. The Moriscos in southern and eastern Spain might rise up to join them. All Europe might suffer the fate Charles Martel had averted nine centuries ago. The emperor had to strike quickly if at all, before Francis I found some new pretext to attack him. He organised an expedition with great rapidity. The Empress remained in Spain in his regent. Her constitution had been greatly impaired by illnesses. She was in the last month of her pregnancy when Charles set sail. Yet her correspondence with the Emperor shows how well informed she was of the affairs of the vast Emperor and how serenely she set personal considerations aside in discharging a public duty. Her letter of June 17th, for example, contains a detailed account of affairs at Madrid, summaries of ambassadors' reports, facts about military preparations, advice concerning relations with Pope Paul III. It is only at the end, briefly, that the woman takes the pen away from the Empress. P.S. This courier I send purposely to have news of your Majesty. I myself am in good health just now, so are the Prince and the Infanta, our children, for although the former has been slightly indisposed, he is now quite well. Just a week later, the Empress gave birth to a second daughter, Joanna. In a very short time, she resumed the direction of Charles's empire, kept him informed of everything important, had prayers said in the churches of Spain for him and for their cousin, Queen Catherine of England, who was believed to be in danger of death by poison. Charles, meanwhile, had gone to Barcelona and there put to sea on May 30th, under the great banner of the crucified Christ. He undertook the expedition with the most solemn conviction that the safety of all Christendom hung upon the issue of this crusade. Although his preparations had been most secret, he sent a courier in a last-minute burst of magnanimity to tell his old enemy Francis what he intended to do and to invite him to follow to Africa and join in the crusade for the glory of God and the common good of Christendom. Francis immediately sent a messenger to Tunis to inform Barbarossa of the sailing of the Christian fleet and of its strength. His agent, La Forest, was already on the way to Constantinople to suggest that Barbarossa attack Corsica, while Francis marched through Savoy to seize Genoa. If the plan succeeded, Charles should be made to cede Hungary to the Turks and to recognise French suzerainty over Milan, Genoa and Asti. France should also dominate Flanders and Artois. Ignorant of this unspeakable treachery, Charles was on his way to Africa. He had some 30,000 troops, Spanish, German and Italian chiefly, and 64 vessels, including 20 galleys, fitted out by Pope Paul III and as many Portuguese caravels, and a brave representation of the Knights of Malta, 
all under command of Prince Andrea Doria of Genoa. The first real test of the Emperor's military capacity was about to be made. He disembarked in Africa on Wednesday, June 16th. Six days later, the day of Fisher's martyrdom in England, he set up his camp before Tunis. He took by storm the fortress of Galeta, the shield of Tunis, driving its defenders under Sinan, the Jew, into the city. He seized Barbarossa's fleet. Meanwhile, Barbarossa, warned by Francis, had assembled an army of 100,000 Moors, Berbers and Arabs, including 20,000 cavalry. Of these, at least 50,000 faced Charles's somewhat diminished force under the walls of the city. The Christian army was in a desperate position. Provisions were running short. Water had to be doled out drop by drop in the burning heat. Charles, serene, confident, efficient, for action always brought out the best in him, spent the night of July 13th passing among his worn troops and encouraging them. At the break of dawn, the emperor and his officers heard mass and received holy communion. Barbarossa commenced the battle, which raged for hours. In the end, the superb organisation and discipline of the Spanish Tercios turned the scales. Barbarossa and the survivors of his slaughtered host fled into the desert. At the most critical moment, 20,000 Christian slaves within the walls of Tunis revolted and opened the gates of the city to the conquerors. Barbarossa had feared this. The night before the battle, indeed, he had made up his mind to have all the Christians burned or hanged. He is said to have been dissuaded from that atrocity by Sinan the Jew, whom he roundly cursed later for his humanity. The imperial troops, Lutheran, Morisco and Catholic, made a poor return for the Jews' mercy. No sooner were they within the gates than they began to slay and pillage. It was in vain that the emperor and his aides tried to stop the massacre. The mercenaries, remembering only the cruelty of the Muslims in a hundred cities, were beasts, crazed by thirst and triumph, with water and loot at their feet. Upon restoring Tunis to Muli Hassan, Charles sailed for Italy in high spirits. Under difficult conditions, he had proved himself a great commander. He wrote home that he had fallen off his horse and had got the gout, but God had sent him a plaster for his malady. When he arrived in Italy that autumn, he was hailed as the saviour of Christendom. He was visiting his kingdom of East Sicily for the first and last time when the death of Francesco Sforza, to whom he had restored Milan in 1529, gave Francis an excuse for reviving his own claim. Charles attempted to conciliate his enemy, but the French king was resolved to fight again. In February 1536, he invaded Savoy, crossed the Alps and made himself master of Turin and most of Piedmont. Charles, who had gone to Rome to celebrate Easter and to receive Holy Communion from the hand of Pope Paul III, broke into one of his rare but violent fits of anger in the presence of the Holy Father, and all the cardinals. If Francis insisted upon war, he cried, there must be war. Whoever won, the Turk would get Europe. Rather than that, he would fight Francis hand to hand. That summer, about the time Prince Philip was having smallpox and learning his conjugations, the emperor invaded Provence to draw the French away from Savoy. He advanced through blackened fields and smouldering villages, laid waste by the retreating French, until at last his supplies gave out and he had to desist. In November, he returned to Spain. The war continued until Pope Paul III in 1537 induced both monarchs to make peace. Meanwhile, the Turks kept their agreement with the French. Barbarossa's fleet appeared in Italian waters with the French ambassador on board. Rome was in a panic as the Muslims raided the coast of Apulia, landed near Otranto, laid waste the fair Italian countryside, dragged women and children off to be slaves. Only the failure of Francis to keep his word with them and to make a simultaneous invasion from the north caused them to withdraw at last and to attack Corfu. Meanwhile, the army of Charles's brother, Ferdinand, was shattered by the Turks in Hungary. In July of that next year, 1538, the Pope went to Nice to arbitrate between the two august combatants. Francis, though hardly in a mood for a treaty, was prevailed upon to sign a ten years truce based in general upon the status quo but recognising a French protectorate over Mirandola. This linked France to Venice through Ferrara with important results. Venice became more than ever a centre of international intrigue and French agents could slip through Italy to board Venetian ships for Constantinople. Spanish influence in Italy had been considerably weakened. Francis could now afford to be generous. It seemed that he had begun at last to understand the need of peace among Christian princes. Within a year after the Truce of Nice, he boarded the galley of Charles at Aigues Mortres, 
talked with him on the poop for two hours, gave him a diamond ring by which he said he betrothed him for a brother, swore on his honour that he would never attack him again, but would be friend of his friends and foe of his foes, and especially agreed never to ally himself with the Turk against Christians. The emperor made no effort to conceal his pleasure. It was said that he had never been heard to laugh so gaily as when he told the Venetian ambassador afterwards what had happened. In truth I am full of joy, he said, for I hope that the fortunes of Christianity and of my friends will go right well. He hastened back to Spain to make plans for a new crusade to thrust the Turk forever from the western Mediterranean. He needed men and money, money and men. The great obstacle of his plans, the enmity of Francis, had been removed. What could not he and Francis accomplish together for God? Charles was undoubtedly sincere. The African campaign had brought him to maturity in more than a military sense. Whether it was gout or long reflection or both that sobered him, he had come home with a much more realistic view of the world. He was now willing to allow Francis to be more influential in Italy, willing to share Milan with the Valois by marriage, willing to end the quarrel over Navarre by marrying Philip to Jean d'Albret, willing a bit later to hand over the Netherlands to a French prince with a Habsburg bride. Human enough to fight for what was his when it was attacked, he was the only strong ruler in Europe who combined, with an irreproachable private life, a real desire for a Catholic world, even at the risk of some private loss or inconvenience. Charles, at 36, had the reputation of never having been unfaithful to the Empress, even on his long travels. Apparently, they decided, about this time, the idea may have come to Charles during his sufferings in Africa, that when Philip was old enough to rule, they would retire from the wearisome world, he to a monastery, she to a convent. He wanted inner peace, but first he must bring about peace for Europe. This was to be gained, he thought, by a great crusade of the Christian powers. The thing looked promising in the autumn of 1538. Henry VIII had been in a conciliatory mood since the death of Catherine at the beginning of 1536, poisoned, in the opinion of Chapuis and her Spanish doctor, by orders from Anne. Francis I was so friendly that he seemed to have become a different man. Prince Philip, though only eleven, was intensely interested in all this, as he gravely discussed, both with his parents and with his miniature council, the affairs of the world. He felt keenly the miseries of his cousin Mary Tudor, orphaned by her mother's death and her father's cruelty, and living in daily fear of poison, until the birth of Jane Seymour's son made her relatively unimportant. Another cousin, Maria, daughter of the King of Portugal, and just about his own age, appealed to him in different manner. She was said to be beautiful and good. He began to think of marrying her. That winter the court went to Toledo, to the immortal Alcazar. The empress was far from well. It was her fifth pregnancy, and there were disturbing symptoms. In February her life was almost despaired of. Nothing else was talked about in Spain. As for Portugal, advices from Lisbon said there had been only two subjects of conversation all the winter, the empress's health and the placards. A most abominable event has occurred here, wrote Luis Sarmiento de Mendoza to Queen Mary of Hungary. In three churches of this city, placards have been affixed containing the most detestable heresies that could be imagined. To judge from the scandalous allegations against the church, the author of the placards must have been a literary Jew. The king had offered the huge reward of 15,000 ducats for the apprehension of the offender, and many Muranos had been arrested. Prayers were said for the empress in Rome. Pope Paul III was trying to induce the emperor and Francis to make war on Henry VIII as a veritable crusade in defence of Christian unity. For a while, the Pope seemed likely to succeed. Both monarchs withdrew their ambassadors from London, but nothing came of it at last. Francis had other objectives, and Charles thought it more important to drive back the Turks. But who can read the future? Early spring brought hope that the Empress might have a safe delivery. But there was a relapse in April, and on the first day of May, in one of the ancient rooms of the Alcazar, she died, and her child died with her. The grief of Charles was terrible. He could not eat nor drink, but knelt hour after hour beside the bed, looking at the beautiful pale face of his dead wife. At last he arose, composed and silent, and wrote brief announcements to the Marques of Aguila at Rome and to others. He then retired to a Geronimite monastery near Toledo to spend eight weeks in prayer and meditation. Of the thoughts, emotions and reactions of young Philip on that day when the skies closed in on him and the person he loved best in the world was snatched away, 
we can only conjecture. When the funeral cortege passed slowly down through the black draped hilly streets of Toledo and out of the antique gate into the plain, it was Philip who rode at the head of the melancholy procession with Francis Borgia and heard on all sides the sobs and prayers of the people. A lonely boy of twelve, slender and pale, trying to sit very straight on his horse and to remember that a king's son cannot weep like ordinary children. The coffin of lead, surmounted by the imperial arms and those of Spain and Portugal, was drawn through the greening valleys to Granada, where the empress had wished to lie with her immortal grandparents. It was not so terrible a journey as that one in winter, when the corpse of Isabel the Catholic had been carried by the same route, but it was bad enough. Many days passed before the warm vega lay at their tired feet, and they came up to the shadow of the Alhambra, and down the gloomy stairs to the dim royal crypt. There at the last moment some of, some of the young nobles who had worshipped the Empress wished to see her face once more. When Francis de Borgia, or Borgia, saw what decomposition had done to the features that had been compared to those of Our Lady, he cried out in a passion of grief against the vanity of all earthly beauty and greatness, food for worms. A funeral sermon by one of the most eloquent court preachers strengthened this con conviction, and it was not long before he was kneeling at the feet of the man he had once seen dragged through the streets of Alcala as a prisoner of the Inquisition. That man, Ignatius Loyola, had become a personage and a portent. In 1534 he had gathered a few friends on the heights of Montmartre to form a new spiritual army, with Christ as their captain, the cross as their banner, and the salvation of men's souls their meed of victory. Thus quietly, without trumpets or drums, the Society of Jesus came into the world. The Marquise of Lombay, as its third general, was to overcome the aversion of Charles and the Grandees for these men who insisted on taking the words of Christ quite literally. When the Emperor came forth from the monastery on June 27th, circumstances no longer permitted him to think of a crusade against the Turk, much less against Henry VIII. For in Ghent, of all places, the city of his birth, there was a dangerous revolt. Its origin was somewhat mysterious. It was not the common people but the patricians, or porters, one of the three governing classes who objected to paying the Regent Mary a subsidy to which all the rest of Flanders had responded loyally during the last war with France. When Mary had some of the chief agitators arrested, the disaffection spread to the Guild of Weavers and to some of the 52 lesser guilds. All summer the situation grew worse. Mary wrote her brother late in September that it was now a question whether he would be master or varlet, he must either prove himself a prince or see communal government in Flanders. It took Charles till the end of the year to settle his affairs. Various marriages were being suggested for Philip, some even for the emperor. Pope Paul III suggested a marriage with Marguerite de Valois, daughter of Francis I, as a means of ensuring peace in Europe while the emperor fought the Turks. The proposal was adroitly conveyed by Cardinal Farnese when he went to Spain with the Holy Father's condolences. Charles wrote his ambassador in Rome an account of the conversation. With regard to our marriage, the answer was that although a widower, we had children and had resolved not to marry again, but that we hoped that between our progeny and that of the most Christian king, matrimonial alliances must might be formed so as to render the peace firm and lasting. To a later renewal of the proposal from Paris, he replied, We pray the king to renounce the project, we have no intention of marrying again, and we are, moreover, too old for Madame Marguerite. When Charles departed in December on his punitive journey to Ghent, he left Philip as governor of Spain. It was the beginning of Philip's public life. True, he was surrounded by old and experienced statesmen, such as Alba and Cobos, on whom the emperor could depend to see that no serious blunders were made. The prince had detailed instructions what to do in case of his father's death, how to end the Navarrese dispute by marrying Jean de Albret, the titular heiress, and how to end the quarrel with France. On the walls of his apartment were maps of all the world, showing the infinite number of places he was soon to rule, and on his desk and in his head, innumerable facts and not a few important secrets, and two unshakable principles. He was being treated as a man, and he was not yet 13 years of age.